Many of the dresses from the early 19th century are made of lightweight ethereal fabrics, and saris from India formed a good basis for fashion at the time. This dress is constructed of a sari. It has an outer dress, the green that you see in the skirt, and underneath there's a little underdress that's undecorated except for the hem that matches up with the rest of the skirt. It also has a little bolero style jacket to give the wearer a little bit more variety. It's a very thin, filmy fabric, and so it makes you look um, very fashionable and very feminine. Hillary's gonna come out and join us next. And she's wearing a cra crossover style dress, also made from an Indian sari. And you can tell this by the decoration of the hem and the gold trim in the skirt. There's a very elaborate panel used in most Indian saris as a decorative drape, and this forms the back of the skirt to provide more interest. It also has a little matching belt that goes with the trim in the skirt and the trim at the sleeves. The wrap styling is very nice for a lady who may not have a lady's maid handy, and it's something that one can put on oneself. Many of the garments that are higher fashion require a lot of help to get into and out of, even though they don't look quite as extreme as their earlier or later cousins. Our next example is also a ball dress, once again made from a starry, and this is based on a fashion plate from 1813. The original fashion plate was intended to be made up of a cashmere shawl, and it has a very heavy decorative trim and a line of trim that runs down the front as well. The headband has a Greek key design. Many of the fashions were intended to take after their Greek and Roman predecessors, and um, this was kind of an allusion back to ancient Greece and Rome and that um, kind of that culture of arts that the French and British Americans and Canadians felt that they were carrying on the tradition of over time. We'll go outdoors for a moment to something that is a little bit more typical of walking dress. Women of fashion had dresses constructed for different activities, and if one were to be outdoors, because it is unfashionable to be in the sun and freckle, you would want to keep both your face covered and your arms and your neck. So this particular dress, it's made of a silk, it's called a lustrig, and it's based on an example that is in the collection of the Genesee Country Village and Museum dated 1810. It's an American example. It has a little crossover bodice. It's actually kind of an illusion because it closes on the left-hand shoulder and underneath the arm. The neckline is very low, but it's filled with what's called a chemisette. It's very much like the Dickey of 1812, if any of you remember those from winter time. Um, the hat has a very broad brim to provide protection from the sun, and this is a silk over buckram construction. You'll see that style of hat construction over and over again. It was very popular from about 1800 to 1830, and it is also complemented by straw hats during that time, which were popular for women. Jennifer's gonna join us next, and she also is wearing some out of doors clothes something a little bit more edgy. And this is a style that would have been popular in France at the time and maybe carried on by a young woman over on this side of the Atlantic. Um, it wasn't unusual for women to have access to fashion plates, sometimes in as little time as four weeks from the time they were published. The jacket styling is from the first decade of the 19th century. It's kind of a harlequin look. And the hat is intended to look like a Roman gladiator's helmet. And if you kind of Close one eye and look closely, you can see that the feathers form kind of that centurion's type helmet. So again, the Greek and Roman kind of touch to it. This is our first outfit that actually has a jacket. Um, they're called Spencers at this time. This one is made of velvet. And what we're going to do is show you what the dress underneath looks like. The high waistline that you're seeing in the garments is very indicative of the early 19th century the empire style of fashion. And this is popular at this time and it reappears almost 100 years later, right around the turn of the 20th century. This particular dress is made of a cotton dimity, a very utilitarian fabric, but also a very nice, light and airy fabric for a woman's dress at the time. It's easy to clean, it can be boiled to get spots out. This particular example is a French example from 1810, and it's in a book called Revolutions in Fashion, patterned by Janet Arnold. The sleeves have a very large globe-like appearance. 
Those developed during that first decade of the 19th century. You'll see some of our dresses have tighter sleeves. The really puffy, glow brown-like sleeves start to grow around 1810, and by 1830, they're these huge leg of mutton sleeves, also called guijot, and uh, kind of take on a caricature-like appearance at that time, but they're still fairly reasonable during the 1810 to 1820 time period. Our next dress is also made from a sari. This, again, is evening wear. This example is made from silk with gold embroidered trim. And you can see the headband itself is made from the same trim as the dress um, around the bottom. It was common to use headbands or combs at this time to accent the hair. And it was popular to do the hair in an updo with little ringlets, um, some hair framing the face and the like. Ostrich plumes also are an accessory that's favored by women at this time. And you can just put them into the hair with a headband or with some jewelry in the hair. And it gives you um, an evening look. It's rather dramatic, but also easy to carry off. You'll also notice that a couple of our girls have these little tiny handbags. They're called reticules at this time. Um, there's a supposition that it might be related to the word ridicule because People picked on women who carried purses like this, at least initially. But it gave women something to carry their belongings in, because prior to this time, when you had a fairly wide skirt and it rested at the waistline, you could have a huge pocket that tied to the waist that you could put everything in. You could put your keys, your money, your cat, your dog, all <laughs> kinds of different things. But with this slender silhouette, you can't carry around a pocket like that. It forms an unsightly bulge, and so, the um, reticule was adopted in place of that. These are very sophisticated, even when they make their first debut. Everything from a little fabric bag to hammered metal. And they take on quite a number of different characters. Our next model has an example of a little bit earlier styling. When we talk about things that look like they come straight out of the ancient world, this dress has that type of appearance to it, along with the headdress. Um, it looks a little bit more French in design but it's actually on a fixed band and it's more of kind of a mob cap style. Um, the tight sleeves are indicative of the earlier part of the periods and as I mentioned they get a little bit bigger and wider as you go from 1810 to 1820. But this dress is made on the same pattern as the blue dress we saw a little bit earlier. It also closes on the left hand side up on the shoulder and it has a series of little pleats around the back. Many of the skirts are actually rather full, but all of the extra yardage for the skirts, sometimes up to 120 inches, is pleated into a four inch section at the back of the dress, and it gives the wearer a very slim silhouette. The back of the dresses is also cut very narrow, so that when viewed from, um, from the back, it makes the back look very slender, it draws the eye down, and it actually makes you look tinier, makes the wearer look more slender although all these girls are really slender in, in real life. <laughs> Our next model is wearing a two-piece outfit, and I want to talk about her outer garments first. This is a walking coat. It's a fairly lightweight coat that would have been worn in the spring or in the fall, and it's based on an original example from an American collection. The original was done in a white eyelet, um, or a white cotton with eyelet trim. This is of a silk. And even though it's very light in appearance, it's unlined, just a single layer, it's actually very warm because silk is insulating. And so if you're a little toasty sitting in here, you can imagine these ladies um, with their multiple layers of clothing that it gets a little warm. The hat is a soft hat, also made of silk, and it has a little turned up brim and kind of frames the face with a uh, brown ostrich plume across it. We're going to take the outer jacket off and show you the dress underneath. This one isn't quite as complicated as the last. <laughs> Although I may have pinned that. I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> this particular dress is also made from a sari, but it's an undecorated. It's just a woven embroidered pattern. And so it's very subtle. It's difficult to see from a distance. It just looks like a solid blue. This is based on an original example from the Royal Ontario Museum. And it's what's called an apron front dress, um, another one that one can put on oneself. The bottom of the skirt comes up and ties just under the high waistline. 
and the bodice is formed by two panels that cross over and tuck into that skirt. Many of our garments also are pinned. Um, fasteners, closures were a little bit more pricey than they are today, and so oftentimes women would use pins as an invisible closure um, in order to make a dress fit a variety of different sizes over a person's lifespan. You could do alterations that were sewn in, but you also could use pins to adjust the size of the garment and also the style. This particular dress I show as a crossover style of v-neck, but when it is on display in the museum, they oftentimes pull the panels across in a square, and so square off the neckline of the dress. Our next example takes us a little further in time. Um, this is an example of a dress that is shown in Napoleon and the Revolution, Napoleon and the Empire of Fashion, excuse me, and dates to the latter part of the 18-teens. The dress styling by that time is taking on a different shape. It's starting to look a little bit more like its cousins that you'll see in the 1820s and 1830s. And it has a broader neckline, a wider collar, um, a lot of trim at the hem, which gives it a heavier, more bell-shaped appearance. And it also has those globe-style sleeves. This particular example, the original is in a striped silk. This is in a striped sateen cotton, but it also has some trim over the bodice that gives it kind of a sweetheart style of neckline and a little bit different look. The garments from the earlier part of the um, empire period or the early 19th century tend to be a little less structured than their cousins at the later part of that two decade period. And so we go from the very slender column shape to a little bit more bell shape. And again, it grows outward until you get to the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, where you have the huge hoop skirts. Fortunately, those don't last a long time because they're rather difficult to deal with. And we return to that column silhouette fairly quickly. This example is um, based on two original garments. And we'll talk about the little jacket first. This is in an embroidered silk. Um, it's based on an example in the Western Reserve Historical Society, and so it's an American example. Many of our dresses close right down the center front, right down the center back, but this is another variation of that close of the shoulder kind of look. And they always close on the left. It doesn't matter where they're manufactured, who made them, which year they were made in. They all seem to have a very consistent closure on the left side of the body. I think that's probably probably more um, related to dominant hand and the tendency to train children at this time to use their right hand. Um, if you're being helped into your apparel by someone else, having your closures on the left make them a little bit easier to do up. This dress example is a British style. It's from the Victorian Albert Museum and it dates right around 1800. It's what's called a bib front dress. Like our apron front styling, it does open at the front, but instead of just stopping at the waistline, it has a little panel that comes up and joins on either side of the front up near the shoulder. Um, it also has hooks and eyes in the back, and it's a little bit broader in its shape than some of the examples from, say, 1805 to 1815. The back panels are a little wider in cut, and because this is made based on an original example, it could be because that was how the individual cut their garment. It could be how they like to wear it. It may have been based on something that was cut down from an earlier styling, or it could have just been the shape of the wearer. We have something rather bold next. Also a French style. Um, this ensemble is made, again, from a sari, and it's kind of a tangerine color, showing you the range of shades that would have been used at this time. A lot of the prints we see or drawing show women in their white dresses, and that is kind of the Chanel little black dress of 1800. But it was very common to have dresses made in colored fabrics as well, even for evening wear. A lot of us debate whether or not we should have a white ball dress, but if white's not your particular color, that's not necessary. Um, this particular styling has a jacket with a um, French style of sleeves, the little buttons down the side. I didn't mention that as she was going past, my apologies. And it also has little tails, kind of like the gentleman's jackets of the time. It was not uncommon to see military influence in the garments for women. 
Um, and this particular jacket has that influence to it with the military style tails and also buttons that run up the front on either side of the center line. The dress itself is based on a fashion plate, a French fashion plate from 1812. And it's getting that style of globe sleeve that becomes popular in the second decade. But it also has a very squared off neckline. Um, if you're not a fan of a scoop neck or a jewel neck, there are square necklines to this time period. There are V necklines, as many variations as we have today. And so if you're considering women's dress of the early 19th century, you're not locked into one particular style. Um, women and fashion designers at that time had as much creativity and liberty as they do today. Um, although perhaps we have a slightly smaller range of garments to work with since we don't actually get to do women's trousers or jackets or t-shirts at this time. We have one more example to show you, and before we begin with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the women are wearing underneath their dresses. <laughs> okay, and on cue, gentlemen, please cover your ears. Um, hum, twinkle, twinkle, little star yourself for a couple moments. Um, it, at this time, um, there's a variety of factors that go into the underpinnings. Um, one is the tendency to not bathe every day. Oh, that makes this all the more appealing, right? <laughs> but really, because of the types of fabrics and the not limited access to laundering, but less frequent laundering than we're used to today, women would wear some kind of underpinnings under their garment to protect the garment from body oils and dirt. Um, it's the same thing with the gentlemen's white shirts. They look very formal, very crisp, but their real purpose is to keep that beautiful waistcoat from getting all greasy. Um, in order to achieve the silhouette of the time period, though, it was very important to wear some kind of stays. Today, it's our brassieres, girdles, those kind of things. But at this time, it's a corset. This is the um, 1960s or the 1800s because for a very short period of time, women in the largest cities threw away their corsets and were scandalous. Probably not here, though, because we're a little bit more straight-laced than those folks over in Paris or perhaps in London. And so women wore stays, even with the dresses that did not require as much structure. However, they're not the long, heavy bone stays of the 1770s or the 1860s, they tend to be shorter in styling. Now women did still wear very long stays, they provide you a lot of support, but they actually shrink up to the rib cage and become essentially a brassiere. So it's our first brassiere, unless you count the ones from 1500 or 1300, because they appear over and over again. But at this time they still have whale boning and provide a little bit more rigidity and give you a very unique silhouette. Um, in the most extreme fashion, it was very apparent that women are wearing stays. Most women, though, had them made to their size, and they don't look as extreme. They don't deform the body as much as some of their earlier and later cousins. I'm going to invite our last example out to join us. And this, again, is a two-piece outfit, so I'll tell you a little bit about the outer garment first. Um, this is my favorite jacket my absolute favorite, not because it's the pretty raspberry color and not because it's a flattering style, even though it is, but because it is very unique and cute in its construction. And it's an American example from the Daughters of the American Revolution um, Museum. It has one long drawstring belt in it, and you can actually see this tied behind, and it controls the additional fullness at the back of the garment. And so the back panel is cut about three times its normal size. It's all gathered at the top on a little bit of piping, and then this belt is used to draw it in around the high waistline. And I just think it's a really cute silhouette, and it's very flattering for the wearer. These examples of garments that have a very interesting back panel to them, or back construction, are common. And I say it's always so that you can give the viewer something to appreciate as you turn your back on them and walk away but really is another feature of fashion at the time and because many of the garments did do up the front or on one side they were able to accentuate back panels and make them more decorative this last example on the dress is also made from a sari i tend to use them a lot because they provide you 
the necessary five yards of fabric, and they give a lot of decoration. Um, this is a very thin but crisp silk. And gentlemen, again, plug your ears, please. Um, ladies, if you look just below her knee, you can see the bottom of the shift, and you can see her legs underneath. Very scandalous, but um, very fashionable as well. Um, this particular garment um, uses the diagonal stripe of the sari, and it's continued all the way around, so it's like a big MOBA strip. Um, it was fun to put together, but that's not really typical of the garments of this period. They were much less interested in matching stripes like we might be today, or even making sure that they had the same number of pleats on one sleeve as the other. So they were a little bit more haphazard than we are in construction, but each woman or dressmaker really put their own touches to the garments, and it makes each one of them unique to the individual. You're seeing us put back on the last little touch of every garment, and it gives you kind of an idea of how long it takes to get dressed. We're rushing. We've done this at least once before, um, but there's still a lot involved in the construction. So before we conclude our program, I'm going to ask the ladies if they take one trip around the dance floor for us so that everybody can get a second look at the garments. And I want to thank you all for your time this evening. Have a wonderful night. Can you? I don't know. May you? Perhaps. Thank you so much, Betsy. That was just a, a wonderful presentation that you put on. Would, it, would I be correct to say that you created most of these gowns yourself? That would be correct. Yeah, an incredible skill that you have. And what amazes me most about the, uh, the ladies and their dresses is the Indian influence. Mm -hmm. Was the Indian influence strong throughout uh, all aspects of fashion at that time? It was very common at this time to take up Indian influence, Oriental influence, Egyptian influence because Napoleon did take a brief tour of Egypt and send back a lot of artifacts that were then adopted into fashion. Um, but the Indian trade and the Oriental trade are, are very big, not only in garments, but in household decorative items, in art. Um, they make their appearance in literature at the time, and so they do have a lot of influence. Thank you so much. Betsy's a Thanks. wonderful resource to our uh, reenacting and uh, our whole historical community. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks. Before the dancing gets underway, folks, we're going to uh, take a little bit of time for our pie. <laughs>